It's time for Mac Break Weekly, episode 209 with Alex and Andy. Today we're going to talk a little bit about that new Mac or Apple product that will be coming out maybe next month and how it could change everything. It's coming up with all the Mac news next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Mac Break Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 209, recorded August 24th, 2010, IPTV. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Improve your conference calls and keep everyone on the same page when you share your screen with GoToMeeting. For your free 30-day trial, visit gotomeeting.com slash MacBreak. And by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com. Offer code MacBreak. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, episode 209 in studio with me today, the lovely and talented Alex Lindsay of the PixelCore.com and PixelCore.tv, where those podcasts live. Hey, Alex. Hi. I, tra I trekked successfully across the Petaluma Tundra. You know, I always wonder, you know, like <laughs> where you've been over the week, because you go all over the world, but in this case, you were just down the road. Yeah, I'm, this, this whole month, I'm not traveling. Oh, that must feel good. That's because I'm traveling all of the fall, so I had to... You know, kind of. Any word on uh, Rwanda? It looks really good. So we're working on, you know, we're trying to fit, finalize the proposal. The proposal is this, uh, you know, our little trip to Rwanda is part of a very big proposal. So yeah, over you're five years. You're, you're doing other stuff there. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, we're just trying to finalize all of that. We're going back and forth with them uh, almost every day. And uh, hopefully really? we'll know in the next uh, couple and, weeks. And would, would it be that to Twit spends a week there? Or? That's, the, that's the game. God, that would be so great. It would be so, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite a country. Can we go see the gorillas? We are definitely going to go see the gorillas. I know it's a hike, it's a trek, it's a long way to go, but I would really like to see. I mean, no, we're, we're absolutely going to go. We're, we're trying to. Do they looks, have 3G where the gorillas are? They uh, they have 3G where the gorillas are, but we've already talked to Live View, and they don't have a. We're trying to work it, out. It a, doesn't work with. Well, that. they don't have a contact, so I'm working right. with uh, the so Rwandan government. So we could actually stream live from the gorillas well, in what, the mist. What I'm working <gasps> on. That's what I'm working on. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So I don't know how that. I don't know how possible that is yet, but we're doing that research right now. Speaking of gorillas in the mist, Andy's the gorilla in the garden. <laughs> Good to see you, Andy Anatko of the Chicago Sun-Times. Leo, Alex, always a slice. I'm here in the secret garden. It is <laughs> my secret garden. He, uh, this is where he brings uh, young uh, orphans to, uh, to learn the skills of gardening. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it takes kids off the streets and into the eats, as we call it. Uh, they learn organic <laughs> farming techniques, uh, no pesticides, uh, no uh, antibiotics of any kind. And they, uh, they come home with a full belly and maybe a different perception about what their future can be like if they just say no to the rock. Off the streets and into the eats. I love it. I love it. Story number one. That's what one. it says on the head. Oh, wait. <laughs> Does it really? No, it says Colorado University oh, Buffaloes. Right. But they're on order. And... <laughs> <laughs> Story number one, the uh, federal agents bum, bum, found more bum, than $150,000 in cash when they searched the house of Apple manager Paul Devine earlier this month in shoeboxes. Why would you do that? Why? Because you don't trust banks. He had a further 20000 in foreign currency. Foreign. You, you never know, know when you need to break could it. Be, could be rubles, could be bots. <laughs> we don't know. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking Chinese. G Chinese money? Well, that's, where he was, that's where he was working. Could be. And Yuan. we have identified a significant... Yuan. Yuan? Yuan? I won. I won. And they've identified a significant number of accounts overseas and a significant amount of money in those accounts. This is the guy who was charged a couple of weeks ago for taking kickbacks from Apple suppliers. It turns out to be quite a lucrative uh, profession. I'd say so. Yeah. Apple's doing well. Who's going to notice? Everyone wants to work with him. He's, uh, it's a good he, position to be in. He's uh, he, The Apple supply manager must transfer... The unknown amount of cash held in foreign bank accounts into the U.S. and post it plus six hundred thousand dollars in bail before he can be released, according to the judge, U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California, 
because he is, they say, a flight risk. He pleaded not guilty to the charges last week. He's also being sued in civil court by Apple. <laughs> he's in a peck of trouble. Yeah, it's not going to work. You know, out I think he's the guy who stole the iPhone, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might as well just throw the book at him. He's the one that's been leaking all these things to <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, my goodness. Yeah. You're supposed to think different, but not quite that different. <laughs> a little too innovative there. <laughs> Uh, Outside the box, but inside a prison cell. Not of good. Not of course, good. I will follow good journalistic precept and point out that he's only accused and, of course, innocent until proven guilty. However, his face has been posted on Facebook for all to see. Mm. No, I just made that up. <laughs> I'm most surprised that any sort of a scam like that would work as well inside Apple because I'm shocked. They are, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're not the sort of company that gives its employees a lot of free hand. No, it's kind of amazing that he got away with it. I mean, if he had that much money lying around, he must have been doing this a lot yeah, unless it was a well i get i get the impression that especially folks that are over in china figuring out how these things are going to get built are are you know anytime you get into another country that like china or india or other things there's a lot of wheeling and dealing that's it going may on well to get be a done. legal traditional thing to do there right well and, and i don't know if it's a legal or traditional thing to do but there is definitely a lot of wheeling and dealing that gets done just in general not even just not even kickbacks but just Lots of, you know, deals that, you know, sometimes I, I think that corporations here in the United States don't want to know about. No truth to the rumors that he's the guy who stole my salad, however. <laughs> well, we're not sure. He's, a, he, he's innocent until proven guilty. Allegedly, he did not steal my salad. Now, here's an interesting uh, note from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Steve Jobs is watching you. <clears throat> this is an interesting interpretation of this Apple <laughs> patent uh, that uh, would allow Apple to, uh, they say, identify and punish users who take advantage of, uh, well, steal iPhones. Um, but it does allow you to spy on your customers. So the patent provides for a device to investigate a user's identity ostensibly to, to determine when and if that user is unauthorized. In other words, if the phone is stolen. However, how do you feel if you knew your iPhone could, one, Take a picture of your face without a flash, any noise, or any indication that a picture is being taken to prevent the current user from knowing he's being photographed. That's a quote. Two, record mm -hmm. the user's voice whether or not a phone call is even being made. Three, determine the user's unique heartbeat signature. <laughs> now, there's an application out there that actually will measure your pulse. You hold your finger over the camera, and somehow it measures your pulse. So maybe this isn't, you know, maybe this is something that can do... Uh, four, to determine if the device has been hacked. Uh -oh. The device can watch for a, a sudden increase in memory usage. <laughs> I don't have that much RAM. <laughs> I, you know, five, the user's internet activity can be monitored or any communication packets that are served to the electronic device can be recorded. And six, the device could take a photograph of the surrounding location to determine where it is. And just in case the GPS that can pinpoint the location within three feet is not working, yes. So it's I don't know if they're planning an app or what. Or you know, sometimes well, no, these patents I mean, are a, meaningless, right? They just well, also it's a patent filing, which means that it's just all encompassing of here's everything that we think we'd like to be able to do with this. Uh, it's ne it doesn't even necessarily have to reflect any product that they even technologically feel as though they can build. They just want to own, make sure they own the idea. Uh, and I, th I think the difference between laughing this off and thinking that this is okay a sensible thing for an organization to write about is that this is the electronic frontier foundation and their job and their the service they provide to the community is to be the people who says well what if the worst case right. scenario comes out uh they're they're not saying that uh, steve jobs personally wants to know what brand of underwear you wear by the by virtue of the fact of activating the camera while you've got the iphone in your back pocket uh but the question, as always, as they state, is, well, even if the phone has the ability to collect this data just to act as sort of a built-in LoJack feature so it can find out who is, is this being operated by someone who is, has this phone been stolen? Is it being operated not by its regular user? And can this phone then make that decision independently to stop, to cease functioning uh, and alert uh, the, the mothership to its presence? But they're saying that, well, if it can collect this data, who gets to track this data? How long do the, if, is it collecting this data all the time? And if so, uh, how long is that data being uh, kept uh, and tracked? And who gets control of that data? Well, and so I think it's, it's, it's a reasonable thing to say, uh, you know, uh, 
I don't care if my I don't care that much if my phone gets stolen. I don't want it to have those features. Yeah. But but if it, but if it had a feature, if, let's say that there was an extra option to find my iPhone. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was. Thinking. I've lost my I've well, there lost is. my iPhone. We have that iPhone. now. Well, well, no. What if what if there was an extra button saying "Get my iPhone back"? That says that I will I will now <laughs> authorize you to take the safeties off this phone, collect any data or, you or, need, or, to or what if I say. Screen. What if I could log in and get that information? But, you know, so I could log into yeah. my own iPhone and say, hey, I want to know where my camera is right now. You know, like, you know, just turn the camera on right now because someone took my iPhone. Well, but wait a minute. Let me, let me just. <laughs> Look at that face. You saw that. <laughs> I don't know what that's, where that sound is coming from. Where is that sound coming from? I don't know, but it was scary. I think it was <laughs> Daring Fireball. I launched something in Daring Fireball. <laughs> so this, this, this is an uh, application that currently is on. Uh, my right. iPhone and is on uh, many yeah, people's yeah. iPhones. Uh, you can download it if you have an iPhone. There's my daughter's iPhone, my son's iPhone, my wife's iPhone, my iPad, my iPhone. It it locates where it is. Isn't that sufficient? It <laughs> it can also. What are you laughing at? It can also. No, no. I just I, I just got an idea for an extra five dollar per month mobile me feature. Where if you suspect that your wife is 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 having an affair with your tennis instructor, you could say T alert me whenever her iPhone is within three feet of my my tennis instructor's iPhone. <laughs> Wouldn't be such a, you know, I mean, these all have well, GPS. But I, but I think look, I could display yes. a message or play a sound. I can remotely lock it or I can remotely wipe it. I mean, and this is exactly where I am, by the way. I mean, it's down to the, the few feet because right. of the GPS. I was I was playing with it last weekend. It's just, it's it's really interesting to find out that, yes, it got a, it, it got the wrong side of the street, but it definitely got exactly where I was. So but we the, already the, have that. What do we need? What well, do we need? To, but, because that's just, I think people understand that GPS is GPS. And people also understand that this is something that I myself have control over and I'm activating. Uh, they, don't under, they don't understand that in general, law enforcement has the ability to access this sort of, this sort of data if they want it. And if they work with a compliant service carrier. Uh, the difference is that I think this is the first time we've seen a patent application that said, here's everything that we think we can do with all of the hardware that's built into a phone to identify the user and locate the exact device and decide... Is the, does this person have authority to use it? But Chiro is then, pointing out quite rightly that this is just a patent application. Right, exactly. Apple, you know, th there was a lot of talk this weekend about the uh, uh, iMac with touch built in. Transformable, right? Yeah, I mean, it's normal to patent everything you can to protect it. But I don't see an advantage to patenting this unless you really think you might want to implement it. And let me just ask you, I mean, Alex, would you buy a phone that had that capability? I, I probably would actually. At first, when I saw it, I was like, "Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even want to have a phone that, that could do this." But the reality is, is that uh, most phones could be hacked to do this anyway. You know, I mean, you know, you could build a hack if you wanted to to build to do this. Uh, number two is, I think that this, I think that this patent has more to do with what Andy was talking about, which is allow you know an extension to find my phone than it is for Apple to have a central control over it. I think maybe dealing with. Um, uh, uh, people who are jailbreaking their phones might be a minor piece of this, but I don't think it's the major part. I think that it's really right. someone takes your phone and you're able to, because the, 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 there's one thing about having GPS information, but if you want to build a case on theft, you know, being able to turn the microphone on and the video on and be able to see who this person is who's got it is going to put them in uh, um, jail much quicker than just knowing where the GPS location of the phone or, is. Okay, so, so maybe it's for enterprise purposes. Maybe it's for government Maybe it's just a defensive patent. Maybe Apple. I mean, let's 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 look at the other side of it. Maybe Apple just doesn't want anybody else to do this, so they're going to patent it. Right. I mean, there's, to protect there's a, us. I mean, you can imagine if uh, you know, in some countries, not uh, in you know, for instance, kidnapping is something that is a is a pretty, um, you know, true, relatively common you, thing. Yeah. If you had an iPhone that was able to do this, and someone was able, you hit one button and suddenly just starts, you know, out exporting that, or if someone else could do that remotely when they find out. You know that could help a lot in tracking you back down again. So there's, I think there's a lot of advantages. Obviously, there's huge uh, uh, security concerns that that would have to be addressed. I think that there's a, there's a little bit of common sense inside of the fact that if Apple abused this, it would be the end of the iPhone. Andy, would you buy a phone that had this capability? If it were uh, marketed to me as a feature where if you if the phone's stolen, this will help you get it back, and I have full control over it, it, this is this is essentially a box that's locked up inside the phone that only I can unlock and let those features be activated. Then sure, the, partly that's because I'm already all too aware that any time that I use the internet in any way, shape, or form, uh, unless I'm gonna 
manage my cookies so uh, in such a fine-tuned way to turn off, uh, decline every single cookie that comes in. I can't be on the internet for more than 20 minutes before I have given up so much personal information about who I am and what I do that I, you know, that it's, it's just uh, futile to worry about the possibilities of a company remote activating a phone to turn on the microphone, especially when there's so such a non-benefit to them using this as a way of customer surveillance. Which you would never know. That's the beauty of it. It's like yeah, this high again, school in the, in the lower meridian in, in Pennsylvania. Right. You'd but never again, know. That's, that's, it's also a thing that can also be done with many, many other phones. Again, if law enforcement wants to know where a phone is, if law enforcement okay. wants to turn on a microphone remotely, uh, it is possible on many phones for them to do that. Really? So, right. Well, um, and I think that we, I, I think. It's, now it's, I want to throw away my phone. Well, I mean, I think that I'm scared. I don't like that idea I'm not, one bit. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's a point and click sort of thing, but <laughs> when a, when a, when if if a person is of sufficient, I, this, we're, we're, I'm, a person I, of I interest, to, I, I, I need to I need, I need to navigate the that margin between things things that I know for sure, things things that I've been told, things I can't talk about, and things I know and can talk about and fully understand. Uh, that's this is one of those areas. But there, when a person is of sufficient importance to law enforcement, it is possible to get that kind of a warrant and that kind of approval. It's not the sort of thing where just some guy in some uh, some 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 suburban police department can click a button on some windows app and get that sort of surveillance but it is possible with cooperation through the carrier to make that happen and we know uh, and we know how how hard carriers make it for the federal government <laughs> to access anything personal so in effect because in the past the the wiretap laws where you had to get a warrant and what you could do was listen in on phone calls and there were some strict rules about what you could do while listening on, on those phone calls I know this from watching The Sopranos. If it becomes <laughs> if it becomes a personal call, they have to hang up for thirty seconds. And right, you can't. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's what it really. said in The Sopranos. Okay. No, anyway, let's that's... assume it. Anyway. Either way, it doesn't matter. But yeah. now I'm carrying. It's not just my calls. I'm carrying a bugging device with me at all times with a camera. But I guess I'd argue that we already are. Well, I the know same, I am. Yeah, and, and that's what Andy's saying. Yeah, it's and, no, and no, but. I, but I, Okay, I'm saying that the chances that the chances that my uh, it's 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 hard to phrase it in such you're a way. That I understand you're hypothesizing it. No, well, no, I'm, I'm saying that I'm saying that the the level at which that that feature would be that quote feature unquote would be enabled on a phone with my up my knowing it would be so bizarre and so impossible to think about. Uh, that and the the amount of safeguards that would have to be put into the device to ensure that that could never possibly happen would so hinder the other operations of the of the device that it's not something that I really worry about. I mean, this right now I'm you know my uh, my my home has windows that let right. light in and also let light out, and that is an invasion of my privacy. And if someone wants to set up shop you know a block away with a with a uh, parabolic microphone and a telescope, they can see what I'm doing. I feel as though the advantages of having natural lighting and being able to see out of my house outweigh the <laughs> the risks to my security. This is a so little that's why more I than a parabolic microphone and a camera, though, Andy. Let's face it; you carry this everywhere. You got in the no, bathroom I'll, with look, you. Got any, anybody, any, anybody with one hundred and twenty dollars worth of credit on their on their Mastercard can buy the equipment to to spy on me inside my house legally from the street. Uh, whereas the ability to turn on that microphone is is right. so difficult. You need the FISA that, cord. And Right. If I mean, it's not you, something we actually just have to be and make it happen. My right. hummus or something to, to really trigger that kind of we're highly protected. <laughs> I don't you'll forgive me you if I don't to. fully trust uh, the U.S. government after the Patriot That's, Act. OK, but yeah, I mean, there's there's what can be done and what is rational to believe would ever be done right now we're, we're looking at as a patent filing in which apple has outlined various technologies but they that they can use to exploit the features inside your existing phone to identify the user and possibly remote disable it that's all right. we have right now and with a lot if of these corporations gonna oh, go ahead i was gonna say with 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 either apple or ibm or microsoft a lot of times a lot of these patents are protective as, right. as you were talking about earlier right. all that all, it's it's anybody Anything that you can think up right, right. now, you, you don't even know if you're going to yeah. use it. You just patent it so that no one else patents it right. so that you can you have that freedom because you may think of something that is not even related to this patent, but it, it touches yeah. on this patent and, and you don't want somebody else to patent that idea. Which is why we don't it, often don't report on these Apple patents like the 27-inch touchscreen. Although I think that I one's met. really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's off that really great site, uh, Patently Patents. Apple. Yeah, Patently uh, that, Apple. That and yeah. and and it's it's both. It'll both show you the 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 alpha and the omega of Apple patents, where you see things where you can then sort of connect the dots later on and figure out that yeah, that's exactly what they're working on uh, for the iPad. But then you also think see things like and a patent for an idea of a special kind of display that can actually 
uh, it's actually that the parts of the display can actually raise themselves up to form buttons and form active controls while still remaining full display characteristics and full touch interaction characteristics. But yet they're now they're raised bumps that form a keypad or a keyboard. Mm. And you wonder, well, I've never I'm not aware of any sort of technology that would make this work. But clearly somebody had this idea, thought that, well, maybe this isn't quite so far off. But we, maybe we should it would cost us, you know, a six pack of beer in an afternoon of pa following, following <laughs> out paperwork to get a patent on this. Let's get the patent. Yeah, yeah. You can't blame it for that. All right. I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I should have known that this has all been capable. I, I, I've gone from being mildly worried about an Apple patent to, to, to complete terror that the government could do this anytime, anywhere. All Welcome they need to is WikiLeaks, a Leo. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Well, it, you know, uh, it isn't really. I, it's, it's, there's just something to be said for people, for someone who says that uh, the government, well, government can't do anything without totally screwing it up, and that's why we can't let them be involved with the healthcare. But yet they think that they're capable of running I such a minute, precise spying to figure out that wow, and Andy's paid eight cents too much for 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 Charmin this week. <laughs> he should have known it was on special at the Shaw's Market right up the street. No, I, I love an ineffective government. I, I love me that. That's <laughs> yeah. good. You don't want the government to be effective. When governments are effective, it's always bad. <laughs> so, so it, you know, I always remind myself when I watch the legislative process and see how badly flawed it is that that's better than the alternative, which is an effective legislative I've always, process. I've always had the opinion that uh, that if the, either the Republicans or the Democrats were in complete control, like oh, pass whatever they wanted for 12 years straight, the country would fall into revolution. <laughs> because it was just, and there are would, those who would like that. Yeah, I'm just saying that both sides, you know, it's yeah. it, it, it the the tension there is, is very up. important. Yeah. So uh, this is the masterful irony of ironies. Brian Lamb of Gizmodo, the editor who got the <laughs> iPhone uh, four, the stolen iPhone four or lost iPhone four, lost his phone the other day. He tweeted, "Left my phone at lunch. Lady turned it in. Good thing we were nice earlier and gave her the chair she at chair she asked for. Karma." Without any sense of irony at all, Brian, <laughs> Brian Lampos' this tweet. <laughs> Nothing like, boy, it's a good thing that didn't happen at the Hofbrau hut. <laughs> Holy cow. I know. <laughs> it's like, and by no, the way, no immediately after he tweeted that, he locked his Twitter account. I yeah, because I'm sure everyone went, oopsies. <laughs> yeah. Oopsies. Oops. It would have been funny if the lady had kept the iPhone and sold it to the highest bidder. With all the contacts and information and everything Ooh. else, or given, or she should have, well, she should have, she should have sold it to Apple for five thousand dollars. <laughs> Steve Jobs would have known what to do with yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I'll treat you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to take a break. Come back with more. Our great guests are uh, Andy Anatko from the Chicago Sun Times and his website, The Celestial Waste of Bandwidth, CWOB dot com, and Alex Lindsay of the Pixel Core at PixelCore dot com, the great guild of multimedia artists. Before I go much farther, I want to talk about go to meeting. We were talking before the show about meeting. You said you're using it more and more, like crazy, oh. like crazy. Where, you know, I, I, uh, it, there was this, some kind of breaking point where I was supposed to be down in L.A. last week, and I just said, you know, we're just going to do this on go to meeting. You know, like I'm not. Gonna you know, you want some irony? I met with Citrix in L.A. And as I'm on the plane, somebody tweets me, what the hell are you doing flying to L.A.? You should have had a go-to-meeting. Right, right. <laughs> well, and, and it's it's gotten so good. We're using both go-to-meeting and like go-to-seminar. And so the, and, and, go-to-webinar, yeah. Or go-to-webinar. And, um, and it is, uh, and both of them, I mean, it's just so easy. And we were having a Skype meeting, and the Skype was constantly breaking and wasn't working and everything else. And we are like, you know, let's just move this over to go-to-meeting. And bam, everything everything is clicking, and I we're able it. to show our, our, uh, our desktops and talk, and it's super clear. And, and, and uh, we're going to be running a lot of our training in Africa from San Francisco over, really? over GoToMeeting. Yeah. So you'll be in Africa. There's enough bandwidth to do that. Well, from Rwanda's Rwanda has got fiber going in. So uh, the connection, the, the location that we're, if, if this all happens and we, we, the proposal goes through, they'll have a 50 megabit connection there. So we'll be able to sit there and log on to their computers and, you know, talk, talk to the students about what they're doing and everything else. And this is uh, a huge, uh, you know, future of just not having to, not having to leave home. I love it. Yeah. They, when I was in LA, they, I don't know how they conned me into it. They have a, a, a series of uh, go-to-meeting ads where uh, you can see people like from the chest up and they look like they're naked saying, I'm having a go-to-meeting right now. Like the idea being you never have to get dressed to go to a meeting. They talked me out of my clothes. I thought, I thought that only happened in L.A. To, to lovely young women. I, they said, just one more button, Leah. One more. I'm not kidding. I did one and it's going to show up on a web page at some point. Where it looks like I'm naked. In fact, they, what they had me do is take off my shirt and roll up my trousers. And they said, don't worry, there'll be a big banner in the middle. And you'll walk off and it'll look like you're not wearing anything. 
The things I do. And they've got this. it all figured out. Obviously, they've done this many times before. It, yeah, it's a green screen. <laughs> right. So uh, I, the things I'll do for a sponsor I love, I'll tell you. Go to meeting. And they've saved me enough time. I guess it's worth disrobing for a commercial. <laughs> I won't do it now, though. If you've ever been on a conference call that just dragged on and on and on, because there was nothing to look at. There, you couldn't see the spreadsheets or the, the, the keynote presentation. You just were sitting there in space looking at your Facebook page, that's where GoToMeeting can help. It keeps everybody on the same page, and it's not Facebook. during Unless you're talking about Facebook, and then it would be. What happens is you you start a GoToMeeting. You could do it uh, ahead of time, send out an email invitation, or you can even do it while you're on the conference call. You tell everybody on the call, go to the website, GoToMeeting.com, and here's the meeting ID. They As soon as they enter it in, even if they don't have the software installed, the software takes about 30 seconds. It'll be on their system, and then they'll see your computer. Up to 15 people at once. Even better, if they have something they want to show you now, they can just say, well, let me show you this. And they take control of the meeting. And you can control their computer. And you can control their computer. You can collaborate. You can both control the computer at the same time. It's really cool for sales, for product uh, demos, training sessions, collaborating, uh, any kind of conference call. Stop the deadly, boring conference call and start having go to meetings instead. Now, you can do it free for 30 days by going to go to meeting.com slash MacBreak. 30 days of unlimited meetings. Go to meeting.com slash MacBreak. Those great folks at Citrix. Yes, I'll take off my pants for them. <laughs> we thank them for their support. That's pretty much, that's a demonstration of my of my devotion. <laughs> there, there, there it is. Right go there. to meeting. I take I'll, off my pants I for take them. Off, I, I, don't, I don't know what they're going to use as tagline. It's something like, I'm having a meeting right now. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do with it. I'm scared. The full meeting. The full meeting. That's what I think that's what I said. I said something like, <laughs> it's such a freeing. <laughs> oh, dear. So um, the guy in charge of the Apple App Store, his name is Philip Shoemaker, but that ain't all he's making. Apparently, he's also making fart and urination applications for the iPhone. <laughs> Right. He sells his own iPhone apps under the company name Gray Noodle. Such classics as Animal Farts. Go ahead and download it. And the urination simulator iWiz. Why would you? I don't. I must. Anyway. Most people get the hang of that after, what, three years? <laughs> what do you need a simulator for? Exactly. I mean, it's possible to put <laughs> too much of your life on your iPhone. Uh, so now he says, oh, no, I made all those apps before I came to work for uh, Apple. And that's, and that's how he got his that's job. How, that's how he got the job. No, Apple employees are forbidden from selling their own apps on the App Store. Um, an Apple spokeswoman told Wired Magazine that broke this story. Shoemaker's apps were published before he started at the Apple, but several, including iWiz, were placed on the App Store after he began his job in March. Philip's apps were written, submitted, and approved before he became an Apple employee. Just before, apparently. His experience and perspective as a developer <laughs> is one of the valuable <laughs> things he brings to the Apple Developer Relations team. Here's a, here's a screenshot. This is, this is really what Apple... Uh, this is the kind of expertise Apple was looking for. This is from the... Panda Poodoo. This is from mm -hmm. the I Animal Farts. You can fart, poot, drop, or whiz. He's apparently a little uh, obsessed with the, the bathroom humor. <laughs> he probably made a lot of money. You know, that's, you know, I mean, they must have known, right? That must have been on his resume. Yes, uh, I created such applications as iWiz and Animal Farts. He has also, this is going to be the new thing that everybody does, deleted his Twitter account. This is like, <laughs> yeah. this is like I'm getting rid of the, the it's like, that's, no. I don't want to talk anymore. I don't want to talk about it. It's the new no comment. La, 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 la. <laughs> He's also del deleted his LinkedIn account, both, both of which uh, l led Wired to discover this. And uh, tech bloggers now are having a great time. Valley Wag found that Shoemaker was following, at least on his Twitter account, 16 porn stars and escorts. <laughs> I hope I maybe should delete my Twitter. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I think I, I, I got to go through my Google Reader account. Isn't I gotta this go the new? It. This is, I mean, forget the camera in your phone. You got Google Reader just, and Twitter. I'm just, I, no, I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't think I'm doing anything freaky, but you know what? <laughs> I would like to point out that in his defense, his account was set up to follow anybody who followed him. Ah, uh, there you go. So he and the, he, the stars were following him. The star, the porn stars. They found out he was the guy behind. I was. I was. They're like, I want to follow that guy. This, this is the guy I got to follow. <laughs>
The iWiz app, according to the Grey Noodle website, lets users make a nonstop urination sound. So that's good, you know. <laughs> you, I know, I, I can get it. I get it. I'm not, I'm not a prude. I get it. You go in the bathroom, your buddies are playing poker, you, you turn on the application, and you let it go for 10 minutes. And they're starting to... <laughs> Boy, he, I didn't... Did he have a lot of... Beer? I just don't know if it'd be loud enough. No. You'd, you'd have to have a speaker in there. You'd have to set up some speakers where you where you let it. <laughs> but you know, you know, if you're at one of those Starbucks where they keep they they won't they won't you won't, won't let you set up like at a table like all day unless you buy something. If you just you know find a stall, get the sound going, you know, for like four, five, six hours, no one's going to come in on you. Just get one of those little oh, IKEA folding, oh, folding yeah. laptop desks. It's like desks. those Japanese toilets you know, that now, make, now, the, make the running water. If you got one of those little portable speakers, that, that you know, those little ones that kind of pop open with a little base, you yeah. probably could put those right against the door and just turn it on, and then people would think you were in there. I finally, those, got to think creatively. I finally got to use one of those uh, toilets when I was back east. We stayed at a bed and breakfast that had one of the Japanese, Japanese. The, the bidets. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my son goes in there and tries it. I don't know if I should say this. He says... I just got my butthole detailed. <laughs> and he loved it, didn't he? He kept going to the bathroom. And I don't we know. have a show title. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, God, already from the other room. <laughs> from, my, from the other room. Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm just telling Lisa, you. Lisa, my CEO, said, Leo... <laughs> I'm getting. I'm getting. I. I. I, uh, I just called an electrician to have an, uh, an outlet. Are you going to have one? You're going to get oh, one. Oh yeah, I'm adding one. It blows hot air at you. It. It. It has different. It has pulsing, and I spent oscillating. Six weeks in Japan, and and by the time I got back, I was pretty addicted to you know technology. <laughs> That's all I got to say. This, this part wasn't in the show notes. I'm not prepared. It's not to in the speak show notes. Topic. It's not in the show notes. We've gone <laughs> off script badly. <laughs> but just think, your iPhone could control it. See, that's how you bring it back into the, into the you know, just think Ooh. of the night. Oh, I didn't think of that. There, yeah. There's an app for that. Yeah, there is an app for Maybe that. Maybe this guy Shoemaker has a future after Yeah, exactly. Yeah, after his, after his <laughs> job that is now probably going to end. Do you Apple. think, though, no, Apple won't let's, let go? Let's, oh. let's, go to, let's go to the patent search now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to see one of those, like, outline diagrams of usage that... All right, rumors are coming in from Mac News Network. Just came in five days ago, so it's exact, not exactly pouring in. Um, the option of a contract-free iPhone in the U.S. has vanished from the Apple and AT&T websites. Previously, I didn't even know you could do this. You could buy an iPhone if you were willing to pay $699 for the 32 gig or $599 for the 16 gig without a contract. Apple now says all U.S. iPhones require a two-year AT&T contract. I, think AT I really think that that has to do with Verizon coming in next year. And AT&T wanting to make sure that they lock in as many people as they can to two years. AT&T says, no, you can still do that. Oh, they did? Yeah, so it's kind of a stupid Don't story. It. I'm actually regretting I even brought it up. Do we, we are all in agreement, though, the January Verizon uh, iPhone? Highly likely. Better than Highly 50%. Highly likely. 50, what do you think, Andy? You probably even know. So if you wanted to recuse uh, yourself... <laughs> Uh, as as usual, as usual, I will believe. Of, I, I'm not doubting this. I'm just saying that we've had so many false rumors uh, about I Verizon know. phones. Uh, although I will, although I will say that this looks better than any other rumor that I don't believe. You have seen the Boy Genius Report, man. These guys are really on top of this stuff. You have seen their uh, their dump of uh, uh, field testing. You know you, uh, what, what happens is they take these new devices. And they field test them. We know this because that's how uh, the Gizmodo phone got out in the wild. Um, and so we've seen field test reports that there are some new Apple devices being tested now, including an unknown device. We'll get to that in a minute. And then a Boy Genius report had this story way down deep with an iOS 4, an intriguing block of code. Look at this. They disassembled this thing. <laughs> this yeah. is assembly language. Uh it says, uh, our source says the code queries the device if the device is either a CDMA phone or something called an iPad. Actually, they call it iProd 2, <laughs> which is, the, I guess, the code for iPad. The device will auto-activate, bypassing the need for iTunes. We're told this block of code has appeared every year consecutively right before a major iPhone device release, release and then removed after launch. So it allows products to be field tested by carriers or partners without having to activate. So there's the signs. These are the signs. These are the little, uh, the little 
little Templars yeah. that happen, the dogs barking, the, the cows leaving the field that happened right before something well, big. And, and this is... Uh, the for those those who want to believe uh you know the thing is remember we we, we had these rumors that apple was running uh, os 10 on windows platforms for years you know they kept on coming up that they're, they're right. practicing for years they're doing them for years and they're like oh well this is never going to happen but you know apple definitely likes to keep its options open i think even if they even if they don't have any agreement to move to verizon they would make sure that the phones were working on cdma so that at any moment they could move um i think it doesn't necessarily say they're going to but i think that they're always going to keep those options open yeah I, I agree with that. The, the number the number of products that that Apple has built but hasn't let out of the barn is uh, but would fill the barn. So, right. Uh, according to analyst Charlie Wolf, Mac sales way up in business. This is good. This is always a good sign when Apple can say we're not only selling to consumers and schools, but shipments to government grew two hundred percent last quarter, sixteen times faster than the tepid twelve percent growth the rest of the market is seeing. And apparently, a good amount of that is government, is a federal government. In other words, Obama likes Max. I think he likes his Blackberry, though. I don't know if it has anything to do with I Obama. bet you his Blackberry, you can't turn the camera or microphone on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing with Blackberry, is that they, they're, they're pretty careful about who gets access to the, uh, well, at least to the texting. Isn't that the big issue? Yeah. In Saudi Arabia and UAE. and That's right. That's why BlackBerry actually gave source code to India and will do so, I'm sure, to these other countries. Now, here's the question is, are they giving them source code or are those, com you know, they, they said we've come to some kind of agreement, blah, 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 blah. And I I'm not India, totally clear. they did give source code to, but did you're they? right, UAE, I don't know what they It said. sounded like they all, they all said, it, it, to me, when I saw the, uh, the way that they talked around what, what, what actually happened, it kind of sounded to me like, like um, BlackBerry agreed to allow the countries to say they've come to an agreement so, people, so they can save face and make people feel like they're, they're out there somewhere, but BlackBerry wasn't going to actually... Then they could go back to the U.S. government and say, no, 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 we're not... We didn't get Something's anything. going on. There's something. They want to be in those markets, right? They do, but I think that it's, it's it, you know, uh, that's a huge selling point for a lot of government and corporations is to have that super secure solution. They, they take that away, and I, you know, and I don't know if BlackBerry has any future anyway. I mean, the storm... Or what is it? Not not the storm. The uh, torch is a the torch. Uh, uh, oh, did you did you ever get a torch, Andy? Did you ever look at it? Uh, no, uh, BlackBerry isn't really on my map right now. It's on the list of things I will take a look at to see if I can get interested in BlackBerry again. Uh, but it's just not a consumer phone. I think that BlackBerry yeah. has really given up the idea of developing consumer devices. I think I feel that to be fair, I should review the new Windows Mobile Seven when it comes out and uh, oh, BlackBerry I'm, I'm, Six I'm, when it comes out, but. Well, I'm, I'm definitely reviewing the, the Windows Mobile phone, the 7 phone, because that's a really, really interesting device. I agree. I'm very, New UI. very keen to get my hands on mm -hmm. it, yeah. Well, let us know when you can to talk about it. It's in the wild. In fact, Paul Therott has one. He's talked about it quite a bit. He's got yeah. uh, either a Samsung or an LG uh, Windows 7 developer version, Mobile 7. But, uh, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Does not sound yeah, like it's, it's going to kick Apple or, or, or Android uh, off the perch, but... It sounds well, pretty what, cool. what, I, what I like about it is that the, the, from what I've seen, I've, I've, I've used one for about 30 minutes. So I, haven't, I don't have much, that much experience with it. But it really looks like they're the first ones that are not, does, not trying emphatically to go after the iPhone, where they're trying to decide what is iPhone and Android not, what are they not doing very, very well, and how can we do that better? Uh, and it, I, it really is the first like 2011 looking interface that I've seen. Uh, it, it makes the iPhone's interface look a little bit, you know, chintzy. And that's a, that's an amazing thing to say. I'm not sure if it's as flexible as the iPhone's interface because the iPhone is designed to not only make phone calls but also be a really robust app platform. But there's so many things about the way that Windows 7 works that I instinctively said, "Ooh, it'd be nice to have that on an mm -hmm, iPhone." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could use if if I had the ability to pin things to the margin like that. Mm -hmm, I, I, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd I'd use the hell out of that feature. I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. I still think it's a two-horse race now. They're going to. They're going to. Th I'm going to get email for the next week saying you shouldn't actually have somebody who's tried Windows on the Mac Break Show. <laughs> it's just not. Shouldn't. It's just not okay. I still think though. I think that now. I think it's. It's a solid race. It's a neck and neck race. But I. I think it really is this uh, between Android and the iPhone. I mean, I don't. I, don't I see think so, else. and I don't think it's even uh, mm -hmm. going to be close. I think the Android is is already starting to lap iPhone, which is fine. Nobody cares. Apple, well, I mean, I know Apple would love to be number one, but look, Apple's been very happy chugging along with Macintosh, making very nice margins, thank you. 
Four percent of the market means if, if virus attacks are kind of non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to start seeing lots of attacks on the cell phone platforms very soon. Unfortunately, the iPhone will be the number one target right now. I think Apple's probably going, come on, Android, come on, Android, come on, Android. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to talk about that because there was, a, uh, there, there was some dis debate. TechCrunch accused uh, Apple of causing this iTunes flaw. John Gruber says it ain't that way. John Pachowski uh, in uh, uh, All Things Digital says, no, no, no. We'll get the story in just a bit before we do, though. Take, take a break. Smoke them if you got them. Because it's time to talk a little bit about our good friends at Carbonite.com. I just the other day checked my Carbonite account. Don't tell a Abby this. The reason I check it is because uh, I put Carbonite on her laptop that she took to college. And I just want to make sure it's backing up. And it is. And this is the oh, one of the things I really like about Carbonite. By the way, Mac or Windows. Let me just tell you what it is first, and I'll tell you why I like this. Uh, it is an automatic backup solution you put on your computer. It's unlimited backup. All the personal files on your internal drive, great for a laptop, for instance, or an iMac, uh, for less than 15 cents a day, $55 a year. Um, and it's to the cloud. So it's, you know, no matter even if your house burned down or you lost your laptop and the backups or whatever, you'd still have that data available to you. AES 256-bit encryption, SSL, all, you know, all the buzzwords. So it's a really good solution. Great for a laptop. They do get stolen. Really great for a college kid's laptop because I put it on there. Abby knows it's there. I didn't sneak it on there. She knows it's there, but she doesn't have to think about it. She doesn't have to think, do I have a backup solution? As I'm writing this paper, do I have to worry about losing it? As every time she's online and they have Wi-Fi, you know, all over the campus in most colleges nowadays, uh, including her dorm room, including the coffee shops, and because it's SSL, you don't have to worry about security there. Uh, it's always backing up. And she can, this is the beauty, she loses the laptop. She can go online in the library or her roommate's computer or anywhere and get that file. She can, there's even an iPhone and a BlackBerry app, so she can always get those files. And I'm, you know, I'm just terrified. I know I'll get that late night call the day before, you know, the term papers do saying, I lost it, erased it, or whatever. You know, a lot of hu human error gets involved, too. I don't have to worry. Carbonite.com. That's my pitch for getting it for a college kid. But you might want it, too, for yourself. Automatic backup that's secure, it's easy, it's affordable, and you can get it anywhere you can get online. My important files are in three places now. Yeah, oh, yeah. The internal three, drive, two, one. The, in the internal drive that I have, yep. um, you know, that, I, that I'm working on. So, like, my Aperture file yep. or whatever. And yep. then it's on a Drobo. Which has got a backup, and it's yep. you know, so it's th that's getting served up, and then it's going on to the cloud to make sure that those are the three places you know that it you has gotta to do it. And if it's in those three places, I feel like you know I'm as secure as I'm you know for the important files, my kids, my important everything. You know, I I go through too much data to put everything on the cloud. Uh, I literally can't. Um, you know, we were debating that. Account won't we, allow that. We were debating <laughs> that here because we didn't want to. Uh, we weren't sure if we should put all of our work files. I mean, we got gigabytes a day, right. and we decided not to back those up. Uh, just just back those up for a month. But then we don't have to worry, you know, once it's, I'm, we're not going to re-edit it. So uh, we figured we won't back that up, but we got to back up all our, our, our business stuff. Peter Krogh, you know Peter Krogh, great photographer. He worked with the Library of Congress to create a site called DP Best. That's fantastic. Have you seen this site? Yeah. It's great for photographers. DPBestFlow.org. Highly uh, recommended if you haven't, if you've never been there. And in there, he talks about all the, you know, workflow for photographers. But one of the things he does, and this is what you should read, is he talks about backup. And Peter calls it 3 two, one backup. It's exactly what you just said. Three copies of every file. Two different forms of media. You don't commit them all to DVD. You don't commit them all to hard drive. And one of them in the cloud, 3 two, one If you don't have that, you're not really safe. Carbonite is, is the one. It's the key in the 3 two, one backup. Carbonite.com. If you use the offer code MacBreak, you can try it free. You don't even need a credit card for 15 days. Just, you know, get, see what it work, how it works for you. If you decide to buy, uh, when you check out, use the coupon code MacBreak for two months free. Carbonite.com. Highly recommend it. And this is, again, this is the site, dpbestflow.org. You probably, have you talked to Peter on uh, Twip? Or We've had him on Twip. Yeah, he's so, I love he's Peter. He's great. But there is a, if you have to, I think you have to search for it. I don't think it's linked from the front. Um, there's a, a a whole page on what three two one backup is, and every you don't have to be a digital photographer to to read this. Uh, everybody should read this. This is with the ASMP, the American Society of Media Photographers, and the Library of Congress funded this, which is a really good site. You must, Andy. You 
you don't just upload to Flickr and say I'm done, I presume. Uh, no, it depends on the it depends on the kind of file. Uh, everything that I write uh, is every every client, so to speak, every publication I write for uh, is a different Scrivener binder, and those all go to my Dropbox automatically. Uh, photos that I, I yeah, can't that's a good way to, to do it. Sure. Right. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of my favorite apps is an iPad app that automatically just uses Dropbox as your storage mechanism uh, for whatever you write. So this is just that's, that's going to be a future pick of the week because it hasn't actually been released yet. Uh, but for photos, uh, is there's like a three layer sort of thing where there's definitely definitely goes on to my Drobo. It definitely I keep buying these three and a half inch pocket drives that are my like my aperture work drives. And those actually when I'm done get actually labeled, you know, just like the, the Kodak carousel saying trip to Yosemite. Yes, this $130 <laughs> Firewire hard drive is now going to be stored away. Uh, but the third place is uh, I, I, things that are really, really good. Things that have been good enough to be selected from the from the scrum and actually edited in Photoshop. Those things go into the cloud as a third copy. So I'm yeah, you're definitely right. You need you definitely need to you got to have three belt, belt suspenders and have a barrel around yourself at the same time or else <laughs> you're, those pants are coming down at some point <laughs> Baby. Or and that's a, in the re reality when i'm because i travel a lot and so i am constantly worried about losing my my uh, my content and so when i'm traveling anytime i get a fast connection i start uploading you know all the stuff i was shooting in africa for instance i mean i don't care about the cameras that much i mean they're expensive cameras and i'd like to keep them but what I really care about are the photos and the and the videos and everything else. And that's what I, the irreplaceable thing. You always buy another camera. You cannot replace right. oh, a yep. photo that you took. You won't be there. And anymore. I have these great little terabyte Western Digital little one terabyte drives. Yeah, I've been buying those. So I got those little ones, and I got two of them. Yeah. And what I do is I is I have my aperture library on one of them, and mm -hmm. the other one's a vault. Mm -hmm. And, they're, and, they're, and so they're they're the mirror. And so every night, every night I just let let it run the vault. Mm -hmm. So I got two of them, and I keep them separate. So when I'm traveling around, when I'm walking around in my hotel room, there's one, and then in, in my body, there's one. Right. So I, I'm hoping that. I don't lose both of them at the same time, but anytime I get that's near when it's most precarious is when you're traveling because you, you then you're taking these pictures, they're really important pictures, and you're you're not really connected to your home network, right? So you really don't have the opportunities to back up that you would. And, and having a cloud yeah. that that you can put them to is it's really neat, is useful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also I'll, I'll I'll give you one story just to show you how bad sometimes these problems get. I have one archive from three years ago that's on a simpler uh, simpler tech sorry simple tech hard drive uh, and the drive it's, it's all there on the drive but the drive has been separated from the power supply and nothing on the on the drive or inside the drive says what kind what what the rating of the power supply is and i'm sure that i have a power supply somewhere in my box of power supplies i'll plug into it but i'm terrified to like guess wrong plug it in short out the <laughs> the logic board for this drive uh, the mechanism unfortunately isn't a sata mechanism so now i have to figure out what uh, see that, that's it, whereas if i just simply that was before i got a little bit more paranoid about storing photos well, that's, if i had been backed up to two different spaces wouldn't the fact that i have this working drive without any power to it wouldn't right. have made any difference i think that's why peter says two different forms of media you don't want to kind of rely on zip disks only right because <laughs> at some point they're going to go away yeah and so if you have two forms of media, at least chances are better that one of them will, will survive. You know. Part of that's kind of an organic growing experience. What, what I like about the mixture of the cloud and the Drobo and everything else is that you just keep on updating all that stuff. You keep on putting new drives and you keep on building it. And it's like a cloud of data, either at your, ho at your house or your business or online or both that you're constantly, you know, there's just a lot of data that you're constantly kind of moving this big snowball forward rather than having it in a bunch of little pockets of places. I just set up um, a Drobo FS. I think it, I, it was lying around the studio. I think we had some extra ones because we we're trying different solutions for backup. So I just set it up at home. That's their network attached yeah. storage. And it's cool. So now it's it's on my network. It's visible to all the computers in the house. And then I put Chronosync on everybody, on all the computers. And so daily they'll run a backup. Chronosync just backs up changes. So once they do the big backup, they'll all be back on the NAS. So that's my that's now my local backup is the NAS. And now I'm, I'm going to try this. It has an, there, there's apps you could put on it. And there's a iTunes a media server app. So I think I'm going to move all the music to that. I wish I'd done this but when my kids were buying. They buy all this music. And sometimes I buy the same things you know, two or three I've, times. I've bought a couple of things a couple <laughs> And it would be nice if it had a central database. Yeah. Anyway, moving along. Now, Andy, have you received an invitation from Apple yet? Uh, I have not. Ha Alex, have you received an invitation from I Apple I never yet? receive any. Ever. Me Ever. neither. So is anybody you listening? To. I you used to. to except until for that, that incident. <laughs> <laughs> the little thing with the laptop. Okay, you know, Steve gave me the. the it wasn't hairy like eyeball. you were necessarily being very covert about it. <laughs> I didn't. They never said to me, "You can't do that." <laughs> the Costanza defense always works. Well, 
<laughs> no, I mean, if they, if it had said anywhere, I looked. If it had said sure anywhere. I held up my laptop with my camera and pointed it at the CEO. I got to plead ignorance. Well, I'm, I got good video. We got a lot you of got hits. Good video. Yeah. You came, you came home with the story, and that's the first job of any good that's journalist. It's my job. Exactly. I am not, you know, I'm not really, uh, it's not, you know, of course, I'll never get invited back. So <laughs> it was it was a calculus uh, about whether, you know, whether it was better to do this uh, and never again be invited to an Apple event. That's Scott Shepard in front of me. Uh, I wonder if Scott, you know, maybe they said, Scott, you should have blocked him with your body i wonder if he gets invites anymore who's that guy to my left or my right he looks familiar he should have jumped me he probably doesn't get invited i bet everybody in this picture is no longer invited to apple events what do you say <laughs> no i think it's just sam you. no because you got the stink eye i did i got the stink eye. you got the steve stink eye not many people get the steve stink eye uh, he has to know who you are, and he has to not disagree with who what you're doing. Well, and also got in Apple's own in-house video of the event. This is that's what this screenshot is from. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that might have something to do with it. Anyway, wow. the reason I ask, there's a big rumor afloat that I think September 8th, Apple's going to have an event. This would be normal. They always in September have an iPod event. Uh, this is when you announce new iPods in time for the holiday buying season, in time for back to well, a little late for back to school, but. That's what I was talking about earlier, though, is we're starting to see this un, uh, unusual object out there on the Internet, surfing and stuff. And, uh, and no one could quite figure out what it is. And, of course, the speculation is it's this ITV. Mm. Do you think, let's see, it would be two weeks. You know, if Apple were going to mail an invitation, it would be a week early, not two weeks early. So there's yeah, it'd be still next time. It would be next it'd week. Be next week. There's, I think so. There's still time for us to get an invite. And Andy's the only one unsullied at this point. <laughs> the, more, the question for Andy, will you I'm come? I'm working on it. If they invite you, will I'll you come? I'll fly you out, Andy, yeah. because I am of the opinion it is not an everyday iPod announcement that we're going to see this this time. If, if they do okay. it. I think that, uh, and, and, you know, Kevin Rose wrote a really good piece on his blog, and I think others are speculating this as well, that this fall, Google TV versus Apple TV, perhaps renamed iTV, is going to be the battle royale this fall. Forget iPhone, Android. Imagine mm. an iOS-based device, no storage, thin little device attached to your HDMI cable, to your TV, controlled by the magic trackpad. So you've, you've got all the features of, a, of an iPad or, or an iPad. There could be an iPad app. That would be really cool, too. You'd have the ultimate remote control, wouldn't you? And you can add apps to it. You could add Hulu to it. You could add Netflix to it. Comcast could maybe add an app what, for its What if fans. it was just the iPhone? What, what if it was just an iPhone that's basically connected it's an to your iPhone. computer? What if it wasn't just basically? Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's it not additional hardware. It's just an iPhone 4. It's iPhone I'll tell OS. you why. Because you can disconnect it every day as you go out of the house. No, I'm you, saying, but iPhone, what I'm saying is I, iOS 4... That's all it is connected to your TV. Yes. Permanently. Right. On a little box. In a little box. Right. That, that, the, the, that would be... That's what it is. Right. I know. With, with, just, with just flash storage built in. And that, that could work really well. And giving you your choice of controllers to connect to as long as it has a Wi-Fi signal. So you could control... In theory, you could control by iTunes, control it from your iPhone. 60, control, 60 control bucks by your Android app for the Magic Trackpad. And you can type because the trackpad could be a keyboard. It's big enough. You could type... You could mouse, you could zoom, you could pinch. But I think the key to this, and it's the key to the Google TV announcement too, is apps. It's putting apps. Yeah, right yeah. now you can buy a TV. I'm even seeing ads for TVs with apps. But you, they, you don't. nobody upgrades their TV. There's not a robust yeah. app architecture or app store or ecosystem. You've got Google with Android. You've got Apple with iPhone. You've got the infrastructure. Well, and I think that yeah. I, I think well, one oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. I was, I was just going to say that if it turns if it turned into a holiday a holiday season 2010 uh, battle royale between Google TV and ITV Google TV loses it just uh, it there's no conceivable way that it can beat they can win uh, in that kind of a consumer space because really? remember that Google well because Google TV Google releases it, Google TV is going out the way that Google usually releases things right now they have a deal with Samsung they have a deal with Sony to incorporate the technology Logitech inside too. TVs I was going to say yeah. they also have so this it's a technology it's a technology that will come in certain models with Sony and Samsung TV so it's not they're putting in every and single that's TV not but ideal. they're going to make it as that's Excuse me? And that's not ideal. I agree with you. It should be an add-on. Right. 
and you can buy a Logitech bot. Logitech has also announced that they're going to have an add-on box to make that work. Uh, and so, again, we're talking about two different, we were talking about parts of a very long and complicated lineup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once you have, but even if Logitech, let's say, is really, really invested in this, they, they're absolute believers. And even beyond the, the idea that they think that they're going to be making $100 million off of this in the next year, they just spiritually believe that this is a great product and they're willing to assert themselves to make this work. They still have to talk to Best Buy and they yeah. still have to talk to Amazon. They still have to talk to every single retailer to give it that kind of a prominence. Whereas when Apple decides that that ITV or Apple TV is going to be the big thing that everybody should have, it's going to be in every single mall. It's going to be highlighted right. in every single Apple store. There are going to be commercials everywhere for it. Well, uh, and, and if you're a content creator, like let's use Hulu, that's why I think Hulu Plus has started to emerge. Yeah. You write one app that will run on the Apple TV, but I can also put it on 85 million iPod touches, iPhones, and iPads. So there's already this huge... Well, and, and as a, and, and you're rolling out, uh, you know, I think that we can be, I think we can agree that when it comes to creating an interface for the, the average consumer, Apple is going to pro pro provide a better experience. You know, it may not be as wide, but I don't think I still. I'm not. Think, I'm not one of those cool okay. drinkers. I just think I, I like just Android, but I just think that I think that the people would mm -hmm. will feel more comfortable with an iPhone that interface maybe. than they will with a. I think the, the the issue is is that if you're a geek and you want a total like I want to rip rip it open and do all kinds of fun stuff, and I may do that want that too, then I want the Google, uh, you know, a Google opera. No, I, I think uh, you guys are right, and I think actually what Andy's saying is also super telling because Apple's already in position in a way Google right. is not, but. I don't think the Apple-Google battle is the interesting battle here. The real battle that is laid down by either one of these platforms is the battle uh, of content providers versus content yeah. transporters. Because it disintermediates the cable company, it disintermediates everybody. Because Blockbuster makes an app, Netflix makes an app, uh, Warner Brothers makes an app. You buy the app, you could pay, and you know, Hulu, is a, Hulu Plus is a really good example. Because yeah. you pay and, ten bucks a month to Hulu, not to Apple, up. not to Comcast, but to Hulu. Yeah. Let, let's also not forget that Verizon has an iPad app in the works that will let you, if you're a Verizon FiOS subscriber, basically stream any of their content, uh, any any Verizon FiOS content to any device within Wi-Fi range of your house. Uh, so that's another potential target uh, for every for every single channel you're subscribing to via Verizon Fios can possibly be watched on your iPad or on your iPhone uh, through these devices oh. and every if you if you don't think that the networks themselves are also looking at oh, this yeah. as a way to solve so many of their oh, current yeah. problems and this is also and, and Netflix I think is the best is the best opportunity at, at all of all they are consistently they they, they invested uh, I think that uh, I, I'm trying to remember what the almost exact a billion dollars on epic have, they they just they decided to spend five hundred million dollars on a very very exclusive catalog of cable uh, TV movies mm -hmm. and content, mm -hmm. and they said that they're 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 explicitly saying that we're taking the money that we think that we're going to be saving on not sending people <laughs> DVDs by mail because we feel that right now that that's a tapering down dead end to our business and essentially building ourselves up into the first IP based cable provider. Essentially. And, 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 and here's the key: here's what it solves. It solves the Tower of Babel problem because right now the problem is you're getting content from eighteen different places and there's no unified interface to it so i turn on my tv and it drives my wife crazy what do i do what box do i start yeah, no. how do, now you turn on the tv all you turn on is the itv and everything that every content provider has an app that's pretty easy to manage well and i think that i think it's that, like a channel on your tv you go to the warner yeah. brothers app you go to the disney app you go to the hulu app so it's not a problem now google has a global search tool i'm sure apple will have to come up with some way of you know i don't know you know, this is the problem. Okay, well, tell me where uh, Blossom is. And it says, oh, <laughs> search for Blossom. Oh, that's on these these apps. We need to solve that. But that's easy. Right. easy but, but I, also, I, I also think that, that, that there's two other things that I think really point towards this is I think that uh, the uh, number one is um, the ability to, I mean, the, the need to, to offset Netflix specifically, even though Netflix will be an application on this new app, this new hardware, if it, if it happens, the the thing is, is they're starting to get, they're starting to pull away from a lot of people when it comes to content. And I, I we know that a lot of the content providers don't want anyone to become the biggest game in town anymore. They want to even things out and this evens it out for them. It's in some huge. Ways. The other thing is, is that yeah. the iAd thing makes a huge difference here. Because, oh, there's revenue. Because now you have, you could be running all the stuff without subscription services <gasps> because the iAd now right. runs on everything that goes right. into all of these TVs 
um, suddenly IAD, which is you know, which is doing okay now, becomes a big, big, big deal because this is the kind of ads that the consumers want to get because it's it's not intrusive. It is you know, and suddenly it's getting wide distribution onto the TV. Um, it totally and, and the thing is that what I'd be worried about is, is even the networks. If the network, you know, because now I'm, I think all distributors are gone. It's it's content providers direct to customers. content creators, creators, yeah. and I think even Hulu's in a little bit of trouble because they're aggregating yeah. content creators. But why should NBC even go through Hulu? I think that it's disintermediating. That's what the internet does. But, but I think the other question is: is why should a production company who's selling their stuff to NBC go through NBC? So that's why we have a Twit app. I don't have to right. go through anybody. I have a Twit app. If, in a, if we could put ads in it, we could figure out all sorts of ways to monetize using the Twitter. I mean, you look at a great example. Like, I don't like most of the Food Network, but I, one of the you main have an reasons Alton I still Brown app. It, one of the main reasons that I still have a cable connection right. at all is for Good Eats. You know, and so the thing is, is that if, if Good Eats became an application that I could watch HD shows on, I would probably start pushing my wife to cancel. Their now, cable. here's the, here's, okay, so this is all the uh, utopia, but here's where the fight gets bitter. Because Verizon and Comcast and all these people who are providing your data pipe also count on selling you premium services like HBO. If HBO says, uh, bye-bye Verizon, bye-bye Comcast, we have an HBO app that we're going to make money directly, we're going to disintermediate you. What happens to Verizon and Comcast? Isn't this maybe where no, the battle... They're... Maybe this is why Google gave up net neutrality on mobile they want to preserve it on landline because they see this as a huge revenue opportunity with google tv is that what what happens andy I, I think I think that's when you start seeing all these companies go to tiered levels of service uh, for internet, uh, because number one, that's where they're going to be making their money from now on. If they can't get uh, forty bucks to be eighty data. bucks a month, yeah. then they can get charged that for, for data. And also, not just because that they're being mean little little Johnsons about it, but also because. If everybody starts getting all of their entertainment via the internet pipe, that becomes a much more expensive service to provide, especially if you're mm -hmm. trying to get, especially when you have the season finale of Lost and every house mm -hmm. in the neighborhood is trying to pull down the exact same stream in HD at the same time. Well, you can see so why they would want to charge the providers more for that access to those consumers. That's because, why net neutrality because, becomes important because they will. They'll because, say, oh, hey, if you, if you want Lost, you're going to have to pay us more because you're going to kill our network. Or if you want to, but the thing is, if you want to, if you want to be the the person who's streaming loss to them, whether it's Apple or Google or someone else, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they want to charge you for the the, for the ability to, to yeah. stream, you know, onto their pipe. Now, uh, you know, I I've decided that I think that uh, I think we should just go ahead and let them have their net in non neutrality, except a little catch. I think that we ought to the government ought to be able to tax it and invest that money back into building backbones. We ought to remove all of the all of the uh, um, restrictions against municipalities building their own yeah. pipeline. You say go back to the public internet once again. Allow, well, al yeah, well, here's the deal: is if you're going to take away net neutrality, allow municipalities to do whatever they're going to do. I and agree. if you want to, and, and, and so the thing is, is that you know, take, if you take away the net neutrality, let them have that. Let them start charging. As long but, as there's competition, we don't have to enforce net neutrality. Especially if, if there's a public pipe, you know, because right. I think you know that because I public think option that, is uh, back. The, the, the public option <laughs> where and that public option is being paid by the non-net neutrality. You know, so basically, right. is you know, you know that tax it and build it. Well, isn't that kind of what Google's and, talking about with its gigabit? They're saying, well, well you know, we're going to bypass. These, these guys, because they're eventually they're going to be a toll road. We don't want a toll road, is what we're right. saying. Now, mm -hmm. all of this negates the big rumor that's going on around right now. Bloomberg says that Apple is in advanced talks with News Corp. And, and this may be why they're building that big uh, facility in North Carolina, the D D Network Operations Center there, to let users rent TV shows from News Corp for 99 cents, apparently discussing this with other media companies. Viewers would be able to rent programs from Fox for 48 hours. See, I think this is an old model that's going to go away. Why wouldn't Fox just sell direct? Not forget, and eventually Fox goes away, and the company that makes Lost right. has a Lost application. And, you know, well, you could do a much more interesting... Look, at people. how many shows do people watch? They don't watch everything. They, maybe they watch a dozen shows a week. Maybe you're a NASCAR fan, you watch Lost, you watch Mad Men. You get the Mad Men app, you get the Lost app. And it's rich media, there's a lot of other content. And it's customized it's, for it's that viewership. It's that experience. Yeah. And then I think Fox and CBS and all these guys are in trouble. So maybe Jobs is just okay. going to them trying to get squeeze a little money out of them before they go up belly up. <laughs> well, there, 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 there'll always be networks. They're just going to be a little bit harder to spot because the producers are two and a half men 
Einstein and, uh, and Big Bang Theory. They don't want to be in the business of selling to advertisers. They don't want to be in the business of dealing with bandwidth issues. They want to produce their shows and collect their checks. And they're, so they're going to hire out a company that will provide those services to lots and lots of different and, and, people. And you know who wants to be that company? <laughs> I do. I do. Apple, Apple. Apple computer. Oh, wants to well, Apple and, and again, with the, iAd, they, with the iAd opportunities, there's a huge This uh, is why ability. Apple, I just understand this now, is making the ads. Yeah. They ultimately want to get rid of ad agencies. They could. They want to be the no, whole. No, no, I think they can't. No, no, See, I, they, I don't think so. Is, I don't. I don't. I actually don't think that. I don't think Apple wants to do that. I okay, think that they want to sell them. They want to provide a production service. Yeah. So if I'm, well, I don't think they want to become the right now. I think what they want to do is control the quality. I think that 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 over time, what they want to do is allow it for for don't underestimate developers. Steve Jobs' desire to control the universe. But I think they want trusted <laughs> developers that they're going to outsource that work to. I don't think that. Okay. Uh, and by the way, if anyone from Apple's watching, I, I would like to play. Anyway, so anyway, I mean, this so, is good. Uh, you know what? This yeah. is really good for <laughs> yeah, people yeah. like you. This yeah, is a exactly. huge opportunity for you, Alex. We've been wanting. To, I mean, this is exactly the kind of stuff we've you, been talking exactly about for ten for years. years. Yeah. But you, I, I think the thing that we we can't overlook is the fact that what's always paid for television is advertisers, uh, and aver what a, what advertisers are willing to pay money for is not necessarily viewership, but the right kind of viewership. If I'm trying to if I'm trying to sell this beautiful Andy Notco model thermal mug. I want to I want to target ads exactly the sort of people who are in the market for exactly this sort of thing, and no other platform but com but a computer with a web browser has given advertisers the ability to find specifically right. exactly the sort of consumer they want. Because there's a really great article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was last week, wonderfully long and detailed article about exactly the level of precision by which marketing agencies can essentially profile everybody who uses a browser by a, uh, via tracking of a very, very fine level of control. And so when you have a computer that is not only the TV device, but also the portal to everything that you, all of your entertainment, all of your, uh, all, all, all of your purchasing history, all of your, the news sources and things like that, you essentially have a big data farm in God knows where that can essentially say, uh, deliver to order. I need 5,000 people who are very, very likely to be in the market for a sporty but practical family sedan sometime in the next three months. And they will give you a thousand people that will give you the highest level of return you will ever dream of. Let's and so forget. those are not the sort of things that, that's not the sort of thing that producer two and a half men can really do. So that's why it's always, it's still gonna be these big companies that collect all this data, observe what you do and sell that information in the form of here are a thousand people that you want to target this ad to. Give me, give me, give me money. Thank you very but much. But let's not forget that Apple's also or Google is providing a way for you to sell to do pay better, much better subscription television, ad free subscription television. Because yeah. you could buy the, I mean, Hulu is ten bucks a month. You could buy, the, you could buy, or you could buy the app, or you could, yeah. but, but do a subscription. All of that is handled kind of automatically, and so, it's all and money. And and here's the thing that Apple. Well, let is, me ask you, as as a producer of content, would you prefer the ad model or would you prefer the subscription I, model? I would prefer both. <laughs> there's no reason so to rather, choose. There's no so reason you'd to rather screw the viewer twice. <laughs> no, 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 no. But there's <laughs> the, the here's the thing is that is that for some of the shows that we do, for instance, there are reasons to have a subscription because that market is so vertical that it wouldn't be necessarily supportable from sponsorship. Whereas some of the stuff that we do is wide enough. Right. So the idea is that I would want to be able to. Yeah, I'd um, want to do both too. Some shows, you know, like the Pixicore, for instance, is we are a subscription service. People subscribe to the Pixicore for content that is exclusive to them because that's a vertical market that advertising wouldn't be enough to support it. Whereas a lot of our shows are wide enough that we have advertising that comes in because they're wide enough to do that. And so there's, I think that, that, that having this nuanced view of, and then we, we also sell applications, you know, you know, uh, so, so these are the, um, we use all of these business models and all of them are effective for, uh, different, um, you know, uh, different communities where that, where makes, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense. Wow, <laughs> Andy. I, <laughs> I sorry, just thought I, Andy would have I'm, something to say. I, I ruined no, no, everything. Just, I, for everything. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that it, uh, as I, I, I'm not a producer, but I'm just a viewer, uh, and I tend to rebel when you ask me to sit through ads and pay you money. I'll, I agree. You, I agree. Okay. Well, but I think that the great thing and about the but, but you don't do think, both on no. one person kind of content. He's saying it depends on the content. Well, Hulu's doing that with, or, or not Hulu. Hulu but, is doing that. Well, it's XM. ten bucks a month, and well, I XM. get to see commercials, which pisses the hell out of me. XM's a good example XM of something that. that where you're here ads and you're paying for the service now i have to admit i love xm i would never go back to radio but um uh maybe if you do ads so like we do a little less uh fewer ads not as intrusive well the you, thing is, is i ads right now the way they're structured is they're just sitting at the bottom right. they're not even they're it's not even, they're not interrupt if, if i can watch my shows yeah. and when i go down to get controls to fast forward or whatever i see a little i ad and 
and I decide whether I want to do it, but it's not something that's intrusively attacking me yeah. all the time. I would I would always watch shows on that if I if that's all I got. This is definitely an area in which Apple can win and beat Google or at least steal a lot more of their business than people are thinking. Uh, I was every time I watch a video on YouTube uh, and I see Google's idea of ads, which is I'm going to put this big stripe over the bottom fifth of this entire video that does not go away until you click a very tiny close box. And we don't care that's going to be covering up important information that the video is going to be embedding at the bottom of that video because it's important for us to show you this ad. That gets me really frustrated. Uh, if Apple's idea is to make a much more controlled ad system where it almost seems like a feature of the application that you're using, ideally, as opposed to, yeah, we're just going to plaster, we're, we're going to give you a pop-up ad over the video that you just cannot in any way, shape, or form ignore. You, you just have to deal with it before you get past it. And I think a great example is is Macworld Magazine and, and Wired Magazine. And that is... I read the ads almost as much as I read the magazine. Because it's targeted, because those ads are appropriate. I want to see, oh, like, like I go through yeah. the back of Macworld and the back of Wired looking at yeah. like the, the, no, the, that right. little marketplace area because there's cool things that I want to check how out. That's computer and, shoppers survive for so long. Exactly. You know, it was all ads, but it was ads <laughs> that were relevant, targeted ads. All right, I take you back now uh, to, uh, I think it was May of last year. Steve Jobs, Eric Schmidt spotted at a coffee bar. Remember there was a quote that was kind of, impenetrable now think if this quote now starts to make sense if you've got the head of google and the head of apple together and steve jobs says they're going to see it all eventually so who cares how they get it maybe they were talking about the world of tv and of ip tv maybe not that was right before he said i will kill you for fun <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think, I mean, at that point, both Apple and Google knew what their plans were with the TV world a year, that would be a year later. And uh, I would make sense that that's what the two of them might might well be talking about. And you know what? I think it's not going to be iPhone, Android. Hmm. Well, it, it is. I think it's, I think it's but, those two platforms, the, though. It's those two platforms. But the battlefield is going to be over television. Well, I think the phones. battlefield is going to be this. What I think is interesting is looking at some of these very exciting new new um, touch tablets that are coming out based on the Android that, that were announced last week. I can't Quite a few of these going to be coming But they're like $200, $300. Um, and I think that you're t looking at two companies that are engaging at so many levels. Our phone, our computer, our TV, yeah. eventually our car. It's amazing. You know, it is, you know, and, and they are, you know, you can definitely see how there's going to be just a lot of friction between the two of them because they are competing at every level. You saw that tweet that I uh, retweeted last week. Let me see if I can... F <laughs> it's, I have to go back in time a little bit. Um, it was from a guy named, I think, Phil Nash. He was talking about how the world had, uh, how the world had changed. Let me go back here. I want to quote it exactly because he, he wrote it quite, quite nicely. Well, I think the other thing that's interesting for both, you know, Google has been looking at these these massive pipes, you know, of being able to deliver all this stuff. At the same time, I think that we can all agree that if Apple, for instance, put out an internet service, let's just say Apple bought, you know, decided they're going to provide an internet connection, how many Apple users would buy that internet connection from Apple? I don't know. I would. I don't know. I, there comes a time when you want to <laughs> stick to your knitting at some point. You don't want to. You know. So this is Phil Nash's tweet from August 14th. He says, welcome to the new decade. Java is a restricted platform. This is right after Oracle sues Google. Google is evil, right after Google makes a deal with Verizon. Apple is a monopoly. And Microsoft are the underdogs. Who's left out of this nexus? Microsoft. It's like, where are they? Oh, they that, tried. that's last decade's technology. They, they tried. Yeah. They're still trying. Yeah. But I don't see them as being part of this game. It, it's, it, you know, you see this all the time in technology. People often assume the first mover has an advantage. The first mover almost always loses. And Microsoft was very early with the home theater PC. Apple, even there, Apple TV was early, too early to the game. This is now. This is it. This is, this is when we're really well, starting to see it happen. And I, and I think that one of the things that both Apple and Google have that give them a key advantage over Microsoft is the willingness to jettison their history for the future. Yeah. Microsoft spends a lot of time making sure that the, the current base that they have of people who are installed can continue to use applications, can continue to use stuff that's moving forward, that they're moving that forward because that's a big piece of their puzzle. I mean, it doesn't, you know, they have just a lot of upgrades and they make a lot more money than both those companies uh, because of that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that holds them back because of that backwards compatibility, I think, is their, their past oftentimes glues their feet to the ground. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, Andy. Last last thoughts, final thoughts before we uh, go to uh, our last last thought is that Microsoft is uh, Microsoft is like a mall 
where they just feel as though they have 40, 50, 60 stores and the performance of any one of yeah, them really right. doesn't matter to them. Uh, whereas Google and Apple, Apple particularly, is, they do not put out something unless they're willing to state that this is the most important thing that they're, they've done in the past 10 years and that twice as so much the most important than anything they're going to be doing in the next 20 years. And that's why we're insisting that you should <laughs> try it because it's great and we love you. You're going to love us for having tried it. Microsoft is like, oh, yeah, that's right. I got an Xbox last week. You, you can play with it if you want. I don't know if you want it, but... Oh, I also have a computer over here if you want to use the computer. You know, you're saying they don't have the fire in the belly that Apple and Google have right now. You want a Mountain Dew? You got a Mountain Dew. <laughs> you know, it's like they're not the ones that say, oh, my God, I got to show you this great thing I got last week. It's called the iPad. It's for my books. It's for everything. Yeah. No, you right. you got to try it. You got to right. try it. I think that I think that in, in a lot of ways Apple has that singular focus that Steve brings to it of this is where we're going this is how we're going to do it x y and z and I think Google has the advantage of being willing to try lots of things and letting lots of very creative and independent thinkers run out there and throw things out and 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 make mistakes you know um and you know have their buzz not work completely right. all the time and have all those things and and I think that Microsoft is somewhere in the middle where they have a lot of creative people but sometimes there's a, a lot of infrastructure around them that makes it very difficult for some of that to really percolate out you know, I think maybe. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. As we, we, I'm sorry. You said Leo said wind this up a minute ago. I'm still talking. Oh, no, keep talking. That's, that's good. Like, I love I, it. I just, I, I just I just want to create an exemption for uh, Major Nelson on Twitter, he, uh, who uh, at Microsoft he is like the Xbox evangelist, and he is everywhere, always spreading the gospel of Xbox. Uh, and so th I think that within the entertainment division and maybe within the mobile division, there might be a difference there. But it, there, it, there's been a long time since I've seen a, a Microsoft product demo or Microsoft briefing where there was any sense of urgency that you know, you should definitely write about this tomorrow because it's so great. It's like, oh, I don't know. We're, this is the first version. We'll do the next version next year. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. know. Want to go to Arby's? It's like, oh. <laughs> this, is, this has been a great discussion. I, I just hope that Apple does release this ITV in a couple of weeks because I think we're... The, it's kind of... It's just what we've just laid out, this vision, is just... It's too good. It's too obvious. It's it's I can't. Well, I mean, it's too perfect to not have my, it happen. I'm I'm really glad that none of my family uh, watches the show uh, because that is my Christmas present for everybody. ITV for all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like you know, just, so, just so that just to make sure that there'll always be an ITV every time you visit them, so that you'll have something to watch well, and something it, to do. The stuff that I think I Kevin Kevin too. pointed out is that the ability for me to post photos really really easily. Right. And I don't have to think about it, and they can just turn it on and make it a screensaver on their computer well, on their and TV. That's, and now all the kids are up there in the videos and the, everything. The else. The Roku box will do this. We're starting to see a little like the Roku is like kind of like the backdoor Apple TV because they've got apps now and stuff. Right. But it's it's that without the huge Apple infrastructure and the installed base. Now right. you throw that installed base and infrastructure at it. So we already see this. I put my photos on Smug Mug, and, and as I do, I can on my Roku box. I have a slideshow on my big screen TV, and it's yeah. great. Right, it's great. And I, but but that's just kind of like a mm, little taste. Right. Of and it's not as seamless as it would be if, because the, if we all have iPhones and we're all having this other, yeah. you know, the stuff. I think the no, installed think, base is really yeah. going to be huge. Right, but all, but also I think Roku really pointed the way they did. They did. They did. They did for IT for internet, uh, IPTV what Apple did for touchscreen phones. They simply said, no, it's not going to be a four hundred dollar computer that has great great TV features. It's not going to be a, a home theater thing. It's going to be we got to build it for ninety nine bucks, not hundred bucks, and not hundred one bucks. No storage at all. No storage at right. all. We're just we're not going to be selling somebody a lifestyle. We're going to hook them up to a service that they already use and love and already evangelize to all their friends, Netflix, and then we're going to make sure that everybody who wants one of these boxes can have one of these boxes yep. and show it off to all of their friends. And, and thanks to MediaFly, we are on the Roku box as an application. Yep. You can watch us live. You can great. watch us out, uh, on demand. It's it's we have parity with everything else yep. on the Roku box, and that's <laughs> the whole that's the thing that excites me as a content creator about this app based. I just have to tell you, my, my wife suddenly heard you on in the house. She heard you in the house. She just left. The, she had left the uh, she left the, the room for a minute, and my son had figured out how to go to the Roku. My good, two and a half year old son man. had figured out how to go to Roku, how to find Twit and good play boy. it. And he had Twit playing, and he was sitting oh, there happily on the. I love on that the, kid. On the, Your yeah. kid's a genius. He's crazy with control. He's a how old? Two and a half. Yeah, yeah he. And is. he figured that out. He uh, figured out how to find <laughs> Uncle Leo. He's a frightening little boy. He's a genius. I like that kid. We need more like that. You know, you like it, except when he pickpockets your uh, your iPhone four and then rearranges all your apps and deletes some of them, and then and then you you find him. Um, That's so nice. You know, it's uh, yeah. It's, My genius son has already dropped his iPhone and cracked the screen. But there you go. Ow. Hey, brand new iPhone four, smashed. Hundred bucks.
Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do iPhone repair, and I can yeah. just replace the screen. Mm -hmm. I'm so relieved to know about that. That's yeah. a, was, was it the screen or the back? It's the front. It's more okay. expensive because you have to replace the whole LCD. Right. Because they're glued. It's glued. Yuck. <laughs> I know. So I don't know how much it is yet. I'll have to call them. Those are the guys we had in, iPhone repair. They're just up the street. I'm sorry. Are they really up right up the street? Yeah. I know. I always think it's awesome? funny that bias is right up the street. I always feel I like we should walk up and say hi. Just ask them out for I know. lunch. <laughs> they, they, yeah. They're just like our neighbors. Yeah. Petaluma, man. It's happening. It's a new tech new tech center. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but if you want butter or eggs, this is the place. Mm. <laughs> we can. We you can. Know, I'm pretty sure that the up. entire town shows up for that for the for the for oh, the yeah. uh, parade. Not only does the entire town show up for the butter and eggs day parade, the entire town's in it. So basically, what happens is <laughs> they go forever. by and then they sit down and watch the next stage go by, and then the next stage sits down. It's like a loop. Yeah, it's crazy. everybody's sitting down and in the parade. It's great. Yeah. That's what happens when you have a big parade in a small town. This portion of Mac Break Weekly brought to you by our friends at Audible.com, the great bookstore of audio entertainment. You're going to love 75,000 titles. Plus, I mean, that's that last count. I don't know what they're up to now. Great books in every category. Of course, science, technology, sci-fi, uh, mysteries, thrillers, history. They've got, uh, you know, Felicia Day was on the other day. She said, I like the romance. They have, yes, they have <laughs> romance novels. And there's nothing like hearing a romance novel read out loud. They have uh, classics, of course, young adult literature, children's literature. I am, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Audible fanatic, especially now that they have that iPhone and uh, Android app, which makes it really easy to see your whole library on the iPhone and download what you want. If you go to audible.com slash MacBreak right now, you could sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month. And that first month's free. That first book is free, and you can cancel it any time. So you don't have to ever worry. You know, you could, this is a chance for you to try it at with no cost, no obligation to yourself. We always like to get Andy to tell us what he's reading these days. I have downloaded now Operation Mincemeat because you just raved about yes. that, Andy. What do you got it's now? Uh, this is one that's on deck. I'm almost finished with uh, the book that I recommended uh, three weeks ago, uh, which was the one that uh, I can't remember the name of it. But the, the, it, it was the, uh, the the title about uh, the five different Oscar nominees from 1970. Oh yeah, yeah, I love that. And, stuff. The, and the behind the scenes, I'm yeah. nearly done with that. And it's just another not not uh, not at, on the level of Operation Mince because I have to be I have to be careful. If I like these books, oftentimes like if you talk to me while I'm nearly at the end of it, it'll be oh my god, this is the greatest one ever. You got to get this great one. Operation Mince still like even like a few weeks after. If I have to recommend somebody one book, oh, yeah. that's going to be one of the three that will come to mind to say okay, if you if you don't like this one, then you don't like the concept of audiobooks, which is fine. But this will if you don't like this, then there's definitely something wrong with the way you process books. Um, the next one up is something that I've read about 30% of in at, at Barnes & Noble. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, that was a mean-spirited thing that I did. I didn't mean to. Uh, I, I, I'm, I was selected. And when, when I get nearly to the end of one audiobook, I start like processing, uh, uh, auditioning the next one. Uh, and this one is uh, McSweeney's, Math Math McSweeney's Mammoth Treasury of Thrilling Tales, which is an anthology of adventure stories written by Every author you would ever want to hear an adventure story from. Glenn David Gold, uh, Elmore Leonard, Neil Gaiman, Nick Hornby, Stephen King, Michael Crichton, Laurie King, Dave Eggers, uh, Mike Moorcock, uh, Harlan Ellison has a story in here. Uh, there's oh, just Stephen a, King. So, Stephen King. Uh, this not all read by the author, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Harlan Ellison. On the this looks okay. great. Exactly. Uh, and so I'm like, there must be, uh, these were all written, I believe, ex uh, as, especially for this treasury. So it's not like it's reprinted uh, from stuff that got rejected by, you know, Amazing amazing Fantasy in 1968. Uh, this is all great new stuff. And so I I've, I was really worried about, because uh, I've, I've bought anthologies before and uh, as often as not, I wind up reading about 40% of these stories and skipping over the rest of them because they just don't grab me. So I did go to the Barnes & Noble. I did like pick it up off the shelf just to, just to do my three flipped tests where you just sort of flip to three random spots and see where it goes. And I wound up like sitting there for like an hour and a half, like just reading story after story at the point where I'm like, Andy, you, you, you're, you're kind of stealing this book from the Barnes & Noble. And they're not, they're, they're a print publisher. They're not doing uh, print uh, bookstore. They're not doing very well. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't read the 
the entire thing, but I, I've already bought this one, and that's one, that's on deck. All the stories that I've already read uh, were just absolutely wonderful, and some of them are actually, if you if you're kind of on the fence about this, uh, definitely do a go do a Google search on some of the story titles because some of these are actually available uh, on the McSweeney's website. Uh, for instance, the uh, Elmore Leonard story, how Carlos Webster changed his name to Carl and became a famous Oklahoma lawman, uh, is available in its entirety. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, a, a, a pretty meaty excerpt uh, from it is available uh, on the uh, McSweeney site. So you can get a really good taste for all these stories. And I don't think that you'll be deep into any of these before you decide. This yeah, this great. would be this would be a good one to listen to, I think. McSweeney's uh, Quarterly Concern is a uh, literary magazine uh, created by... Uh, uh, it's a couple of really great writers in San Francisco, so it's kind of a it's a neat thing to see. This I can't wait. Boy, the people yeah. in this Harlan Ellison narrates his own story, which makes it all the more interesting <laughs> for sci-fi fans. McSweeney's Mammoth Treasury of Thrilling Tales. Uh, all I got to say is Audible.com. Just say no to monotasking, unitasking. <laughs> yeah, don't be a unitasker. Don't be a unitasker. Get stuff done while you can't hold a book. Get some reading done. While you're gardening, we're driving. Gym, driving, never waste time again. Walking to the Twit Cottage. I, oh, yeah. Well, anytime I take a walk, I always bring my headphones in Audible. Even my bike rides now, I listen to Audible books. It's great. It's like having a movie play in your head. Audible.com slash MacBreak. We thank them for their support. Why don't you try it? First book's free, but I got to warn you, it's pretty darn addictive. Audible.com slash MacBreak. Time for our picks of the week. I never start, so I'm going to start today. Go for it. Usually I want to give mine. you guys uh, a chance so that if – I want to be a good host. So if you pick something that I was going to pick, I can back down. But I don't think either of you are doing an iPad app. Am I right? Nope. nope. Uh, so I right. think I'm safe on this one. I wish I could remember the uh, publication that I saw this in. I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes because they deserve credit. I, you know, I'm always reading um, articles about new apps and so forth. And uh, somebody said, the best newsreader I've ever seen, I found it. It's called River of News. And you know me. I've been looking for a great newsreader. And a couple of things a great newsreader has to have. It has to be fast. It should synchronize with my Google Reader account because that's where I keep all of my uh, my lists. And it needs to have delicious bookmarking and, you know, good sharing features. This River of News is awesome. Um, it's very fast. And that's a, a big deal for me because I have a large list of, of stories in my Google Reader. I may mean, have hundreds of sources in my gadget section alone, you see I have a 1,000 unread stories. That's not because I haven't been there. It's just because there's always new stuff. Well over a 1,000 stories. But you saw how fast these 1,000-plus uh, stories lo loaded from my tech news section. And it's a river of news. So on the left is, uh, when you're in uh, port in uh, landscape mode, on the left is your sources, but on the right are your stories. And you just scroll through them as a river of news, which is really fantastic. It's a kind of ever-growing river. You can always go source by source. Now, I'll use the Ars Technica uh, feed because I subscribe to their subscriber-only full feed, which I really like. It's the full text from Ars Technica. So uh, this is a good example of you'll, you know, you'll see the whole article. And, uh, and it, it's just exactly what you'd want. Very easy to read. If you, you, know, you can star it, which is, of course, a, go a Google Reader thing. But at the bottom, you can also share it. And they have very, very good sharing capabilities. Delicious supporting uh, Yahoo's OAuth. A lot of readers don't do that. I've turned off a number of the other uh, things. You can have delicious Facebook, Instapaper, Pinboard, Read It Later, Tumblr, Twitter. You can copy the article. You can email it. You can open in Safari. You can do a whole lot of different things with it. I've just got it narrowed down to the things I use all the time. So if I want to add this article to Delicious, I just press Delicious, and boom, it's saved out. That's how easy it is. This is a very, this, I, you know, I've been looking for the perfect newsreader. I would like to see some more features. There's one little bug uh, I I can no longer get into my delicious settings and turn off the private. So unfortunately, it shares private, so I do have to go to delicious. That's a setting at the very beginning. I just can't figure out how to get back to the settings. It's one of the things that really bothers me about the iPad. There's no there's no kind of menu system or standard thing. You you can easily have controls that are just obscure. Maybe if I do it like this, I don't know. I just can't figure out where that you know extra setting is hidden. Uh, you can see in in uh, portrait mode, it's really great. It's just like reading a Kindle or something. Uh, there's your river of news, and you can look at the feeds in, in this way. Really a nice uh, little program. It's not very expensive. It's a few bucks. Do you have it up there? Because uh, I can't. I don't see the price here. River of news. I don't. I don't have it. I'll look. Anyway, my recommendation. Great news reader. 
Now it's your turn, Alex Lindsay, for your recommendation of the week. I have a few small recommendations. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they, I didn't feel like they were they really eat any one of them because one of them is a little bit of a repeat, but I just want to come back to it. Uh, and then Circle round, baby. Here we go. Actually, we'll just do two of them. Uh, number one is I got the new Magic trackpad. You got it. I bought one. I got to get one because now I, I'm I really done with do. the mouse. Like it was really? like literally in the really? first 20 minutes, I was like, oh, I'm not going back. And, and I generally, you know, I, and I have to admit, I spend a lot of time on a laptop, so I'm very comfortable with my, with my trackpad. Really? But, I, but I hooked it up to my, my Mac Pro, and, uh, and I was just like, I started using it, and I was like, oh, I am not, not going back to my mouse. So I was done. I mean, and, and I've been using it for the last week, and I'm just completely happy with it. And um, uh, so anyway, so that was my one pick. I, I think people have been kind of asking me whether I've gotten one and what I think of it and everything else. Well, that's my opinion. Um, I kind I'm of have to buy it. It's, you know, ugh, I don't know. Don't oh, and he's got his already. So, um, he's he's, yeah. he's yeah. using it. It's a good size. Yeah, that's a nice size. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so handy because especially like if you're not in a traditional usage sort of situation, yeah. like right right here, this is a situation where I've got, believe, I've got like a, an external screen, like about on a little perch about three feet in front of me, the, the laptop is behind the screen. And this is just on a little low table, like to my, to my right here, like to simply reach over and just be mousing and controlling things as I go. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I use it when, I, when I'm on the sofa, I'm use it, I use it like and, when I'm in bed, it's just that it's always a always give you a flat stable surface uh in which to mouse on the, well, the only the only thing i don't like about it though is that i really wish that you didn't need to have these two feet on some sort of a stable surface in order to get the click you need to have this i, I really wish that uh you could have this on like sort of an unstable you could surface put it on your lap you can you can also set yeah. it to tap and you can set it to exactly. double. you right. said you can set it to tap on it which is the other uh option um that's what i've been doing because I, I have the same problem with i gotta order it sitting on the couch I or sitting on my it. leg you know and, and what's great is the mouse you had to try to find a good location for it to scroll around and exactly. and uh, and in a busy location like you know and used to you'd be able to use a trackball but this is way better so so you'd suggest if for instance i uh, i i was going to get the, the 27 inch when it comes out next month for my laptop so that i can use my laptop closed with the screen i have already the bluetooth keyboard i should get that yeah that instead is of a mouse. that's the way to go Okay. I'm, actually, I'm actually thinking about like building myself a little table specifically for this <laughs> so that I, I'm serious like something where it's like an integrated uh, it's like an integrated armrest that you can put on the floor that ends with like right here so I could have sort of like yeah. a captain's chair yeah. sort of effect with just putting you know this, what you need you need a little floor. harness that you put over your shoulders that attaches it like a little tray that sticks out from your left no you do you do need kind of a Star Trek thing and then you just for all five fingers is warp eight there you go. <laughs> you know, so the uh, so my here's my my, my other Make it uh, so. my other one, which is a little bit. I don't think I think that you might have recommended this, Leo. Rage, yeah. And I have been using a, this product for six months now. I use it every day, and it's. Do you still use the Y things um, scale? Yeah. I was talking to someone about it. I just wanted to bring it up again. I don't weigh myself every day anymore. I weigh myself I was, like uh, once a week. See, I weigh myself every day. See, here's the, there's yeah. the. Yeah, I see it. That's my. That's here's my his little. here's his Y things graph. See, this is kind of cool. So it, you you know you do you tweet. I don't tweet it. See, that's that's kind of so. So I tweet, but but the, but the graph is great. And and here's the thing: is it's cool because I don't want to write that down. Uh, the reason that I'm doing right. it is because I don't want to write it down. And you this know, is the iPad app, the iPhone. There's an iPhone. This an is iPad the app. iPad app, which looks fantastic. But there's also a website uh, that gives you the same information. Right. And and um, but I love the fact that on my iPhone or my iPad, I can you know it's keeping track of all those things. This is great. And it and the thing is, is that when you do it every day, you can see that long straight one that was when I was in Africa. Right. And um, but the. Uh, uh, the the thing about it is is that it is you just get on and you don't have to think about it and you and it keeps track of it and it gives you this long view of where your weight's going well, and that's the thing if you're doing it every day at least with this graph it shows your trend, trend you're seeing the trend so it's okay to do it every day because you right. can see how volatile it is if you yeah. do it every day but that doesn't matter that's water weight that's yeah. all kinds of other you stuff the that's, trend. it's yeah. a big meal at, at a at a Brazilian steakhouse that actually you know, was that was, <laughs> was uh was fat let's look at weight and yeah, weight's looking good. Oh yeah, there's the Brazilian. Uh, That's the Brazilian. Yeah, I and then, then I went to, and then and then uh, and then there's the African trip, and there's then the trip and then I got Africa. back from Africa and I started losing weight again. Here's when you had the uh, diarrhea for three weeks. That's good. Okay. <laughs> there's the intestinal flu. You know, and, and I find that I find that if you think about what you eat and then you're weighing yourself every day, you actually make you really, need, really interesting it? observations. Yeah. You know yeah. about about what is is going on there, and this just makes all the difference. And it and it so if you're interested in if you're getting into a weight loss program and you use a Mac or an iPhone or whatever, it's expensive. This is, it's yeah, but the thing is, is it, I mean, I don't know, and I don't even know if it's a great scale, but it's all right. It's as accurate. I had another, I had another scale that I kind of tested it against, and they yeah. were identical. I don't okay. know. They were either 
I mean, they, they literally, I'd weigh myself right next to each other when I first got at the sea. And so it's just as accurate as any other it, scale. I think it's about 10, 15 pounds heavy for me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's so anyway. A, no, I love this scale. It's 159 bucks. I actually think that's gone down. It, it does tweet for you if you want, but that's not, you don't have to have a tweet. You can just have it log it. Yeah, I, don't, I just have it log it. I don't, I don't, I don't need to tweet it. <laughs> I tweet. Yeah, so the, uh, but, but I think that um, it is, if you're really interested in, I mean, it is the best tech scale out there and you're still doing great you've lost you haven't gained your weight back or no I've, I've been about the same i've been i've lost about uh, over the last year now i've lost about another six or ten pounds so great. um I but so i lost jealous. 50 the first year right so it was uh so about 60 pounds total so uh, just to f circle around, sparky tells me and he's absolutely right as is often the case with an uh, I, uh, ipad app you should always check the settings in the iPad global settings because there's additional settings there for this program. I can reset my delicious login. So thank you, Sparky, for suggesting that. Still not kind of ideal. I have to start over again with the login, but at least I'll get back to my settings. And it is $2.99 for River of News. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andy Anotko. I have just bought River of News because it looked interesting enough to try. Thank so, you. Good demo. You'll get your 18 cents or whatever the... <laughs> no, no. I, you don't get you're... anything for that. <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. So, you know, I, I have a policy, Leo, of giving you a little bit back. If, I, if you save me 18 cents over the course of my next month, you're getting that 18 cents back. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think, I think all listeners should do that. <laughs> I think uh, you're right. so, 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 so that 18 cents you got like three months ago in the PayPal account? That explains it. It's the love. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, my, my pick is a really cool little app, a little utility called Witch that a lot of people are probably familiar with. But if you're not, boy, do you want to be familiar with this. You can download it from manytricks.com slash witch. Uh, it's a enhanced window switcher utility. Uh, obviously, you already have, you know, Expose and you got all these other little built-in OS features, but this is a much more finer tuned version of this. Uh, for one thing, it does one thing I really like, which is that it will just give you a nice little aquified list of all the windows that are open instead of waiting for uh, previews to be built of 40 different windows on your screen and then sort of having to kind of like peer really closely saying that looks kind of like the document window that has my interview notes on it. I don't know. I'm going to have to click inside to find it, see what see what that is. Instead, you'll get a very nice little pop up list. Uh, the other cool thing that uh, I've been using it for is the fact that it allows you to control exactly what apps will contribute windows to this list because I'm not necessarily need I don't necessarily need a list of the 14 Finder windows I have open. I really just want to see the list of give me a list of all the Safari windows I've got open and all of the word processor windows I have open because those are the two apps I tend to switch between uh, when I need to find one specific window above all others. Uh, so it's it's easy to tune it to uh, the way that you need an app switcher and also you can switch uh, you can define what the hot uh, what the uh, hot switches are going to be the hot keys to activate and uh, switch between apps are going to be. So if you want to use this instead of the standard command tab uh, app switcher, for instance, or the standard expose trigger. You can do it that way. Uh, the only feature that I really wish it did have is I don't I don't know of any app that really does this. And I'm hoping this will appear maybe as a Safari plugin uh, because I so often open new windows in new tabs instead of uh, new web pages in new tabs instead of new windows. So oftentimes getting a list of open windows really won't help me find that one window that I've got Twitter uh, or Google Reader in. And so I wind up just after not wanting to search through 18 windows for the one tab that has Google Reader. I'll just open a new instance of Google Reader. I really wish that there were a utility or a plugin or a, a, a new version of which that simply added added the feature uh, peek inside windows for tabs and add that to the list as a feature. But other than that, uh, it does streamline uh, application switching and window switching. It makes it a lot faster for me. Uh, th there's a free trial. If you buy it, it's something, I believe it's 19 bucks. Uh, it will let you switch 250 times in demo mode uh, before you have to cough up. Uh, but that's a uh, it's, it's a really handy utility. Very good. Which I've, I've been using this for quite some time, and I agree with you. It's a really yeah. uh, it's it, once you get used to it. I think nineteen bucks is a little expensive for a switcher, but boy, once you get used to it, you have to have it. If if it's a business thing, and I I, I should also say that they've got an app they've got an iPad app coming up called Paddock. That that's what brought me to the site to begin with a couple of weeks ago, because I talked I talked. Uh, if they say it's not a secret anymore. Uh, remember the last week I talked about how what I would love to see is an ability to do have a, a, an application that has a tiled interface, so I can have a text editor in one section of the window and be peeking yeah. at Twitter 
one pane. And it looks like many tricks is actually developing that exact same app with this thing called Paddock. Uh, they're, yeah, they've got a video of it in operation with a couple of features that redacted. they say have been redacted. <laughs> I think we can guess exactly what they do. Uh, I'm, uh, they haven't, I haven't seen a working, uh, it's not like I have a working beta of this on my iPad or anything, although I would love to test it, Mr. Many Tricks.com or Mrs. Many Tricks.com or Miss or Unattached Mr. Many Tricks.com. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really curious to see if Apple will approve this because remember that they got uh, they got a little bit of press a few months ago for uh, pulling an application because they thought it was too widget e uh, an app that right they uh, don't want you to change the desktop right so I, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if they will decide that this is too widgety an app and that it has the functions of multiple different sort of the they're not they're, you're not running different applications but it has the functions of different applications like instead of having a separate twitter client a separate web browser and a separate text editor you have one app that has twitter features and text editor features and this other feature i'm wondering if they're gonna if that's gonna swing with uh, with uh, the apple approval process if it's if it swings i'll be there with my 299 or my 499 because it looks like a really yeah, interesting app i had app. the same misgivings when i saw it but on the other hand it is all within its own app so it's not like you're changing the desktop you're just yeah. changing it within that app so maybe there's some hope this is the thing i don't like about the apple universe you can spend a lot of energy on something like this and you just don't know absolutely true you know till it's done and you submit it can you you can't Alex call Apple and say hey this is my idea let me show you a video would you approve this if I made it no yeah. no you just put it up you have to go through the process of putting it up there and and seeing what they do okay hey thanks guys Andy Anako is at the Celestial Waste of Bandwidth www.cwob.com that's his blog you'll see lots of great pictures lots of great stuff but yep. of course you can read him in the paper too in Chicago and the Sun Times mm. any big stories coming up. Uh, I'm choosing between uh, this week will probably be my Kindle review, uh, the, the new Kindle three, which is supposed to be rising, arriving in my Friday, office today right? or tomorrow. Oh, right. hey, it's 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 uh, it's in transit. I don't know when it's going to actually hit, uh, but uh, also uh, follow my Twitter feed. Because I'm uh, my, my uh, follow, uh, excuse me, check out uh, cwb.com because all the details of a trip that I'm making to Chicago next week. I'm giving a talk. Uh, at a user group uh, on Wednesday night, and all the public is invited. I'll have maps, directions, the sort of like fruit punch that I like. If you want to bring fruit punch, that sort of stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm such a really such a really wonderful self promoter that I. It's only just now thought that gee, I could be telling everybody about you should tell me going. To, well, if you're not if you following Andy on Twitter, I H N A T K O. Yes. I have no idea. That's how you remember it. I H N. I have no. A T K O. It's yep. well worth it. I highly suggest as, it. As, as a matter of fact, as soon as we're done with the show, I will put I will put something on the blog right now. So if you go to cwob.com, by the time you download this via iTunes, uh, not by the time you finish listening to this live, because I'm still talking and I'm not actually typing, but within short order, I'll have it. Right go. Thank you, Andrew. Anyway. Alex Lindsay's at the Pixel Core, pixelcore.com for the Guild of Multimedia Artists who are so adept. And you can learn there. You can get trained there. They've got lots of great in-house training. We're doing lots of, uh, of uh, live streaming now for the members. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah, we, we've gone a little crazy. We now have, a, for, the, uh, for the live streaming, we have a, a three, I mean, we have an EX3 and two EX1s, and one of them's on a jib, and we're putting one on, soon we're putting one on a steady cam and then one on sticks. It's mostly wow. to train guys in-house as well. So it's, wow. it's a dual research thing. And we got turning. three JVC camcorders. Those things, those are <laughs> on, uh, on my... Uh, on your recommendation. Because I think that they're... Those are... They're 2500 bucks. So they're not the cheapies, but they're not the EX1. And they, they go straight into Final Cut. Which I love. For the workflow. On standard SD cards. Yeah. Dual SD cards. Yeah, so the, the only bummer about them is, is quarter-inch chips. But if you shoot in a re relatively well-lit place, they're, gonna be, they're great little production cameras. Yeah, yeah. well... Good because we just bought seventy five hundred bucks worth of them. They're worth it. It's for our green tech show. No, they're we shoot great. That in the field. Actually, we shoot in the in the yard. Out <laughs> back. Alex is also at pixelcore.tv. That's where the podcasts are. His Twitter is at Alex Lindsay. A L E X I L I N D S A. Why? Make sure to check out thisweekinphoto.com. It's our coolio, gorgeous little site that um, Fred Frederick uh, Van Johnson put together. Nice job, Frederick. And it's, uh, it looks great. We're so proud of it. Thisweekinphoto.com. Everybody else, thank you for joining us. You can watch the show. We do it live 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesdays. That's 1800 UTC. The website for all our live streaming is live.twit.tv. While you're watching, you can also be tweeting 
or uh, I should say chatting at irc.twit.tv. That's our chat room. And if you got the Twit app for iPhone or iPad, you can just do it all in the same application, which is pretty cool. Thanks to Craig uh, at uh, uh, Shift Key Software, Houdini 7 in our chat room for writing that fantastic application. I think the streaming is getting better. We're working on that. Same thing with Roku. We are on the Roku box. Uh, Mediafly makes a, a Twit app available for almost every platform that exists, including things like the Popcorn Hour. Uh, so look for a MediaFly application or a Twit application on your on your Roku, on your Popcorn Hour, on your Android and iPhones. And that's another way you can listen to our shows. We thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time. Now you get back get, get back get back to work now because break down is over.